Brandon Sanderson is known as one of the most transparent authors who is awesome at engaging with his fan base. He polls them all the time on their opinions on what he should do and the kinds of projects that he should engage with. And so it was no surprise this week when he reached out to them and made this proposal. Would you be interested in paying $5 a month for a couple of annotations uh, every week? The way the poll is constructed, it is presenting one singular proposal to the fan base and asking them for a yes, no answer. And this is a good question to ask when you are at the end of a very long exploratory process and you just kind of want a final conclusion on what option to move forward with. The problem is Sanderson and his team led with this question as the very first question. And so as a fan, when I was trying to answer this poll question myself, I was so confused. Because of this confusion, a lot of people went and elaborated further on their concerns within the comment section itself. And the overall fan reaction was the most negative reaction that I have ever seen in one of these Sanderson polls. And this is super unusual because Brandon Sanderson is amazing at stakeholder management usually. So it is very rare to see him and his team make the kind of mistakes that they did. Hey, it's Deborah with another video on the business side of self-publishing. As of the time of filming, there were 33 and a half thousand views and nearly 300 comments. Most of the comments were incredibly mixed and that is how I felt. Quite a few of them expressed concerns about the poll and how the results would be used in decision making by Sanderson and his team for very good reasons. Survey design is an entire field of its own and I am no expert, but there are so many basic things that Sanderson and his team could have done a lot better. It would have given them a much clearer picture of how his fan base is really feeling about this particular proposal. And most likely it would have resulted in a very different kind of discussion happening down in the comments. So stick around to the end of this video where I'm going to break down all of the mistakes that were made and what could have been done differently to avoid this kind of fan reaction. But first I want to unpack the proposal and the fan reaction itself because I think there are some really valuable takeaways for us as self-published authors. Now because this is a private poll I do do not have access to the results. So in my analysis of the comment section, I tried to tease out the answers to two questions. Number one was whether or not the fan base believed that there was value to Brandon Sanderson providing them with annotations of his work. And number two, what were the main concerns that the fan base had? What I did was go through every single comment in the comment section and I coded them according to the main themes or concerns that were being expressed in that comment. I then also assigned a score to each comment, taking into account how many likes that comment had, as well as whether they had any replies which were agreeing with that particular comment. The graphs that I'm going to show you are based on the scores that I've assigned to each comment. So a comment with a large number of likes is going to count for more in these graphs. And what that data tells me is that there is an overwhelming amount of interest in the annotations themselves. Question of how much value the annotations provide exactly seems to depend on the kind of fan that they are. Most of the people who are interested seem to be casual fans who appreciate the annotations as a little bonus sort of behind the scenes content that add interest but aren't a critical piece for their experience as a fan. However, there is a smaller subset of fans who see the annotations as a window into their favorite author's mind and actively use the annotations in their ongoing fan discussions, as well as the basis for maintaining several fan repositories of knowledge about Brandon Sanderson and his works at large. The smallest percentage of all were those people who are interested in the annotations from a writerly perspective of learning more about the craft of writing by looking into an author's reflections on a published work and gleaning insights from that. There were also minor points in terms of the actual format that was proposed with some people loving the idea of short three to five minute videos twice a week to others who just thought that would be super massively annoying and would actually prefer to get the annotations in text format. 
ideally as an annotated standalone product. This is definitely the segment that I personally fall into. I have all of the collected lyrics of Stephen Sondheim, including his reflections on writing the lyrics, Ira Gershwin's collected essays on his lyrics, annotated version of the libretto of Rent, including all of the behind the scenes on the creation of Rent the Musical by Jonathan Larson, as well as the Hamilton. Now let's have a look at the concerns because I think a lot of these are going to be relevant to you as a self-published author looking to decide on what your business model is going to be. The two top concerns were optics and time. We're going to leave optics to a little bit later because I have so many thoughts on that point. So I'm going to start with time. Sanderson framed his proposal like this. We want to be spending my efforts, my time, and your money in places you would like to see me spending uh, my efforts and time. And the comment that dealt with time fell into one of two camps. The majority by far said, if you have limited time, I would rather you spend your time writing more books. While there was a small handful of people who said, Brandon, you already do way too much for your community, so please don't burn yourself out. I am so glad that there are fans out there who consider author burnout because that is a super real thing, especially in self-pub world when you are super reliant on frequent and consistent releases in order to continually generate revenue. The general reader perception is if an author has more waking hours to devote to sitting in a chair and working on prose, it means that more books will get published faster. And I definitely used to have this perception myself, particularly when I was waiting for A Dance with Dragons. However, my recent experience with Nano has taught me that, you know what, there is actually a limit to how many hours in a day I can put my butt in a chair and work on new prose. Because sometimes when I am truly, truly stuck, more additional hours in the chair does not help me work on the prose. More additional hours on my outline does not necessarily help me untangle my plot issues or my character arcs. Giving the problem some time to sit is what really helps me move things forward. I don't think these annotations have any bearing on Sanderson's pace at finishing the rest of the Cosmere. In fact, I think it could potentially help him write faster simply because by doing the annotations, he's undergoing a reflection exercise on the writing process, which might give him some insights on how to better proceed with the series in the future. So I don't think Brandon Sanderson has done himself any favors in terms of how he framed the problem of why he used to do annotations and then he doesn't do them anymore. One of the things that I like to do early in my career were annotations on my books. And I have just not been able to find time to do this. This really leads to the next biggest fan concern, which was the idea of a paywall. And there's a couple of different angles to this concern. First is the fact that this proposal would go against previously established precedent, i.e. the annotations are released in text-based format for free on his website as bonus content for more engaged fans. But the more important factor that I think contributed to the fan concerns around the paywall is there is an inherent contradiction between the stated reason for why the annotations were discontinued and the proposal itself. It's really surprising to me that Sanderson has made this blunder because he has been very conscious of the issues around equality of access to him as an author as he has grown. And in the past, he's worked really hard to preserve that equality of access as much as he can with respect to signed editions and also book signings. It's really fascinating though, is that the issue with the quality of access seems to be linked to only the ability to pay. The fan base doesn't seem to have a problem with the concept of restricting access based on the ability to invest time in something. I suspect that this is probably because time feels like it's free and time is a commodity that everybody has access to theoretically, whereas money is generally perceived as a scarce resource. Certainly, Sanderson already has restricted content out there in terms of his mailing list exclusives, other unpublished content that is available through only Kickstarter backer rewards or at a restricted physical location. People also seem to be okay with the idea of time-based exclusivity as long as the content would be made available for free eventually. So it just seems that the paywall itself is the really touchy issue. And that that leads to a whole host of other issues to unpack. Let's talk about these one by one. And again, I'm going to tackle the easiest one 
first, whether or not these annotations should be something that is monetized in the first place. The response on this was super mixed. There were people who felt the annotations should not be monetized. There were people arguing that they should be able to be monetized because it is additional content that has value that is being created and therefore the creator of that content should be compensated. There were people who had a problem with the business model being proposed, i.e. a subscription over a one-off cost. And there were people who had problems with the price point that the subscription was set at and still others who didn't feel like there was a problem with monetizing this kind of content, but they had issues with the idea of who those proceeds would go to and benefit. With people arguing for everything from, well, the proceeds should go to Brandon because he is the creator who is spending time to create this content and it is his IP and his work, to people who said, well, Brandon doesn't need it because he's rich enough from all of his other income anyway, so it should go to people who are actually doing the work, being his assistant and the rest of his team, and still others who said, well, you know what, like you don't actually need this income stream at all and therefore all of this proceeds should actually go to a charity of some sort and it was just a gigantic can of worms. If there was any consensus to be drawn from this whole debate is that fans seem to be generally for the idea of a special edition annotated version of an already published book that could be purchased for a one-off price in either ebook, print book or audiobook format. And personally, as a fan, this is the option that I would vote for. But looking at this idea with my self-published author hat on, that is a whole ton of work for an uncertain amount of people in a space that might possibly compete with leather bounds that I already have on the market and other forms of merchandise and would be super expensive and time consuming to produce. There is so much more stuff that goes into it beyond just a couple of additional paragraphs. The Hamilton, which is probably, I think, the best selling type of work in this vein that has been published in recent years has so much supplemental content that is in it. I guarantee the production of the Hamilton was a massive endeavor in itself. My brain just looks at that and goes, oh, I don't want to deal with any of that. It, that. That actually looks like the same level of work, if not more, compared to just doing a leather bound edition. Oh, it is just too much. I would be better off writing an additional book or a series. Which brings me back to the fan concerns around the utilization of these proceeds and also the whole issue with the optics of using Patreon as the platform platform and a subscription based model. It is really hard to untangle all three of these things because they are so interlinked in this proposal that Sanderson has put forward and so we're just gonna kind of discuss them all together. Let, let's dig into the optics. It, it kind of all stems from the fact that Sanderson is one of the top selling authors in sci-fi fantasy right now. His net worth has been estimated to be in the ballpark of 67 million. While none of these sites putting up these estimates are sharing the methodology, he has enough money to to build an evil dark lord lair. The main sentiment which Sanderson himself expressed as well as in the entire comment section was that Patreon, it's best served for smaller creators, which is why I haven't ever started up a Patreon. I'm like, hang on, the whole notion of, well, I'm not gonna support Sanderson because I know he doesn't need the money to live on and I'm gonna support this creator instead because I know they really need that $5 to make rent or something. It, 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 it the whole idea of the Patreon slash patronage model is that a creator can be directly supported by people who find value in the things that they create. I really don't like this idea of having that patronage becoming untangled from the value that is being created for the patron and instead being awarded on the basis of whether or not that creator needs that money to actually survive. Because then you get into the issue of, well, where exactly do you draw the line between small and large creators? And regardless of what criteria you were gonna use to draw that line, the message from that is basically, well, the more successful you are because you are creating more value because you are becoming more skilled as a craftsperson, the less I feel inclined to support you, which just kind of does my head in. Because if you believe in a framework of meritocracy and being rewarded and compensated for your work and and the value that you create in the world, then like this is the antithesis of that. It's a double bind that I think really disincentivizes authors and any other creators out there from continually improving in their craft. Because why would you spend the additional effort to ever get to that level of success if you're just gonna be penalized for it? 
that Sanderson himself and so many people in the comments section keep saying over and over again that they dislike the idea of large creators moving over to Patreon and taking a buy out of the small creators pies. That's got a very zero sum outlook. When I find a new author, I don't automatically go, oh, well, too bad. I can only support X number of authors at any one time. I end up supporting more authors in whatever way I can. I do think that this concern comes from the fact that Sanderson is a super established author in traditional publishing, I suspect that he would not have this issue if he started out as an indie or as a self-published author. If you actually look at Patreon, there are a number of people that I would consider to be large creators on there who are making significant income from Patreon and Patreon is not their only source of income. Both of these authors specifically are on Patreon pulling in good money every single month from it and while neither of them could claim to move the same amount of books and have the same level of commercial success as Sanderson, these guys are not small authors either. And I don't think anybody complains about them being on Patreon. And if you wanted to compare somebody in the same weight class, Pat Rothfuss is a Twitch streamer. He's actually a Twitch partner. And while he has not moved nearly as many copies as Sanderson by virtue of not having nearly enough books out, he has achieved a level of success in sci-fi fantasy that I don't think anybody would hesitate to put them in the same category. Although maybe people don't complain about Pat Rothfuss making money off his Twitch streams because they're actually too busy complaining that he's not finishing Dawn of the Stone. Another huge concern in the fan base was the idea of exclusive content being locked behind paywalls and therefore actually negatively affecting the quality of the fan discussions about the books. There are a lot of online, very engaged fan communities for Sanderson related things. And the two biggest examples are the Coppermind and the Arcanum, which are repositories of all things Sanderson and is run by the official fan community, the 17th Shard. So a lot of people were concerned about the impact on these fan repositories. If there were paywalled content, you would have to pay for that content, which honestly most hardcore fans wouldn't mind doing, but the fan base was really opposed to the whole idea of any sort of paywall dividing the fan community in terms of how it would impact information being collected in fan repositories to whether or not it would affect their ability to discuss the books online and as well as concerns that it would fragment the fan base between those who were true fans who subscribed to the Patreon and those who were not. I think there are three lessons we can take away from Sanderson's experience here. Number one is to consider scalability. While most of us are unlikely to have the extent of Sanderson's scalability problems, it is still an important consideration to keep in mind. The more scalable your activities are going to be, the easier it is going to be for you to set up systems and processes for you to manage your business as as you grow, which hopefully all of us are. I'm actually running into a huge problem with the scalability of my engagement on my kids' books right now because not only is it not sustainable for the long term, I also am dropping the ball all over the place whenever I attempt to try something else. So yeah, that is a difficult problem that I have not yet figured out how to solve. The second lesson is to consider the strategy behind the platforms that we choose to include as part of our author platform. In the past, Sanderson's strategy for engaging with his fans has been very clear. Reddit was for personal interactions and discussions. Big updates and announcements were posted on his website. Twitter was kind of for these ad hoc frequent updates. YouTube was where you went for his videos on the craft of writing as well as live book signings and Q&As, while his mailing list was for fun little anecdotes about his personal life as well as the occasional sneak peek at things he was writing or short pieces of fiction that he wrote as writing exercises that weren't going to be published anywhere else. These days he's on so many platforms and cross-posting so many things that I am actually a little confused as a fan as to where I should follow him for what news. Sanderson has an Instagram and a Facebook as well, but I don't actually know what the value proposition of those two are. The more platforms you had, the harder it is going to be to juggle all of them and the more effort you have to spend in order to make sure that whatever you are posting on each platform, there is a unique value proposition for somebody following you on that particular platform. And when you don't have a team to help you with all of these platforms, uh, it, it's really hard to stay on top of it. I actually kind of regret choosing Instagram as my platform because it rewards frequent and consistent posting and I am not posting anywhere enough to be effective. And if I could do things over, I would probably focus all of my efforts on my mailing list instead. 
The final takeaway for me was to utilize business models that don't create unbridgeable divides in the fan community. And based on my analysis of the discussion that went on in Brandon Sanderson's comment section, I would say that these are the rules. Investing of time is okay. Investment of additional money is okay when it is exchanged for a good that has enhanced value. Tread carefully whenever you are dealing with bonus content or exclusivity and never, ever, ever do anything that is going to impair fan discussion of your books. And while I am very grateful as a fan to Brandon Sanderson for his transparency and also super grateful as a self-published author to learn from his experience, I also think the entire thing could have been avoided had Brandon Sanderson and his team just approached this poll slightly differently. The first mistake was in terms of how this poll was distributed. Since this was a wide distribution instead of a targeted distribution, the best you can really hope for is a high level temperature check. The poll itself is really a feasibility study on a potential product and the main objective is to gauge the potential customer demand and therefore be able to work out what the potential ROI is of developing that particular product. However, there are so many problems with the way it was framed that the poll was kind of doomed from the start. This poll question kind of creates the impression that no other options are being contemplated, that they are much further down the track than they really are. So Sanderson had to put in a whole bunch of upfront disclaimers about the poll. Producer Adam of this channel has suggested um, a method of making it happen. I am uncertain on this. I don't know if people are that interested. Um, a good that we're not sure if people want a thing I could provide, but it's really kind of up to you if you are interested. We like to listen to you. We don't like to overwhelm you with things to pay for and do. And so we're going to have a poll. Which has a huge impact on the kind of data that he's going to get back from his fan base. What he should have done was lead with a single question on the core product product itself. Would you be interested in more Brandon Sanderson annotations? Once you have established that, you can go on to ask another question which opens a funnel for those who are interested in this potential product for you to reach out to them for further information with a more detailed survey. This separate survey is where you would unpack all of these elements that you've gone through by utilizing multiple question types in different sections, conditional questions based on earlier survey responses, and making sure really carefully in the design of the question that you are not influencing the opinion of the people you are asking for in any particular way. When done right, surveys are really powerful tools that let you gather information from a lot of people in a very efficient manner because they already present the results in an easy to analyze format. It's a skill set that I think every self-published author should try to be familiar with because it can help you do so many things more effectively. If this is something that interests you, let me know in the comments below and I will do a more detailed walkthrough video on exactly how I would have designed the entire survey. In the meantime, here's another detailed video breaking down what another author is doing and what you can learn from them.